Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Lab at uh, Mission San Luis. My name is Jerry Lee and I'm an archaeologist with the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research stationed here at San Luis. Now archaeology is simply the study of the human past. Now Mission San Luis, since it was a mission founded among the Appalachian Indians by the Spanish, there's a good bit of documentation about it. And some of those old documents might tell us that there's a Appalachian Council House in the village or a church on the plaza, but the documents don't really describe those buildings in much detail. Now through archeology, span we've been able to locate where those structures and others were located and get a good idea of what they looked like. Now I wanna spend a little time to talk about architecture at San Luis and how we record that kind of archeological evidence. Now, San Luis was not a typical mission. It was uh, home to not only the Appalachian Indians and a friar or two, but there was also a, a garrison of soldiers stationed here. There were Spanish administrators. There were also a number of Spanish civilians here. Now this means that San Luis is a great place to study the architecture of both the Appalachian and the Spanish. So how have we been, how have we been able to locate uh, some of these old buildings? Well, the first thing archeologists did when the state purchased this site uh, back in the 80s was to set up a grid across the entire site so that any point on the site could be located. Then after the grid was in place, they used several different methods to test the entire site. And one of the testing methods that we have relied on to get us close to mission period structures was an auger testing survey. With auger testing, the archeologist punched little holes in the ground every 10 meters and recorded the kinds of artifacts that came out of those little holes. Sometimes larger numbers of ceramic fragments might suggest uh, you are in the vicinity of a mission structure. If you found old hand wrought nails from a test hole, that might suggest that you were in or close to a, a mission period building. If burned clay or fired clay is found in larger amounts in an area, it might suggest that you're close to a daub structure. A wattle and daub was a building technology that was used more by the Spanish than the Appalachian. Uh, clay plastered over a wooden framework, and if, this, if a, build, a daub structure burned down, then the wood burned out and the clay was fired hard and it remains in the ground for us to find. The auger testing results can't tell us exactly where a, a structure, a mission period structure was located, but it can get us uh, in the vicinity of it, get us pretty close to it. Old structures usually leave evidence uh, in the ground where they were built. If a mission building was constructed with posts, as most of them were, we can often find the dark stains in the ground where the posts were after they burned or decayed. Uh, for structures that used big, large wooden posts, we can often find the, the post hole that was dug into the ground originally to set the post into place. Now, some smaller mission structures were constructed with wall trenches, and we can often find uh, dark linear stains in the ground that represent where wall lines or fences may have been constructed. This kind of uh, evidence of structures doesn't usually leap out at you. We dig separate two meter square units at San Luis in 10 centimeter levels. And we usually dig four of these two meter units together to form a four meter unit. After each level, we carefully clean up the unit or units we photograph and map uh, any soil discolorations or stains in the, in the soil. Any intrusion or different colored area of soil is given an identifying number and excavated separately from the soils around it. This careful documentation of what we see in the dirt sometimes allows us to see patterns uh, like lines of post molds in the ground where a building once stood. We'll look at some photographs and maps of 4 meter unit 236 north, 300 east to illustrate how we do this. Now the first picture is of this unit after we had already dug four 10 centimeter levels 
uh, from each of the four two meter units. You can see four darker stains running at an angle through the unit. Uh, it was map 243 uh, that documented those four darker stains and also other soil uh, differences too. We had a pretty good idea that those four dark stains were post molds in the south wall of the church. So we began to cut them in half. This is called profiling or cross-sectioning. Profiling a post feature allows us to accurately record the size, the shape, and the depth of a post feature. Now this is a, a picture and map of that very same unit during the cross-sectioning of the four post molds. Here you can also begin to see the post holes that were originally dug to set the posts into the ground. Finally, here's a photograph of the four post molds and post holes after we finished profiling them. In both the profile photo and the profile maps, you can see that these posts have a deep, shallow, deep, shallow arrangement of depth. Now, we wouldn't have seen this if we hadn't cut them in half. One thing to remember is that it was the Appalachian who were building most, if not all, of the mission structures. They were actually very good at construction, so good that the Spanish remarked about it and actually chose them for a couple of special building projects. The large circular council house at San Luis really showcases the Appalachians' abilities as builders. Now let's look at a few artifacts that we've recovered from San Luis uh, that are dire directly related to architecture and construction. Uh, I mentioned wattle and daub building techniques before. Clay plastered over a wooden framework to form walls, and this is an example of just that. Now, uh, the wooden members are right here. There's one, there was one here and one here, and what's, what's left, once they burn out of the wall, firing the clay hard, is the negative impression of the wooden uh, members. And here, even the uh, vines or rope that lashed these two wooden, wooden members together is preserved in the fired clay. It's also been burned out. And as most of our daub structures are, this had a layer of whitewash, probably on both the interior and the exterior. Now this is another fragment of daub, uh, but here this piece was up against a plank or a hewn or squared post. And what you can see are the, the linear impressions of wood grain running up and down. Now the, the wood has burned and that's what's fired the, the clay hard, leaving that impression of the wood grain behind. Okay, I mentioned uh, spikes and nails. These hand-wrought uh, spikes and nails would have been used to frame structures at San Luis. Uh, these are colored black because they've been uh, preserved. Now we have one hammerhead that was recovered from a, a ground surface collection at San Luis. And you, you can see the handle would have been right here. And it actually looks a good bit like a modern hammer. This uh, claw hammer design has been around for a really long time. And a hammer like this would have been used to drive some of those wrought uh, spikes and nails, uh, uh, framing some kind of a structure. There was a, a fragment of a saw blade that was recovered from the Ford excavations. It's actually in the gallery on display uh, right now. But saws were definitely used to cut planks and prepare posts. Uh, you might remember the posts that we saw the profile of in the church had very flat bases and uh, th those posts were probably prepared uh, with a metal tool like a saw. Um, the fragment of daub that we looked at earlier might also suggest uh, the use of a saw. These linear uh, wood grain impressions would have uh, been from a, either a plank or it may have been from a squared post. And a squared post might have been uh, prepared with a tool like this. Uh, 
This is called an adze, and it's a woodworking tool. Uh, it would have had a long wooden handle right in here. It's gotten bent a little bit. And it would have been used to turn round uh, small parts of tree trunks uh, that were used as round posts into square posts. And when you would use it down at your foot level to cut these posts into, to cut these round posts into squared shapes. Most of the posts that we've uh, profiled at San Luis have a round shape, but several from the church and several from the friary were actually square in shape. And this adze was actually found just outside the friary. So it might have been used to uh, prepare some of those squared posts. Now the block house out at the fort was a really massive structure. Some of the largest spikes and pieces of hardware that we have found have come from the blockhouse. Uh, very large spikes like this. Now these would be difficult to drive into wood unless you uh, started a hole for them first. And these tools are called uh, augers and they would have been used to begin the holes to drive a, a very large spike into wood. This is the cutting edge down here, and it has a pointed tip, a squared pointed tip, where probably an iron bar with a square hole in it would be set over it in order to turn the auger, to, to begin to drill the pilot hole, is what it's called, to, uh, get, to be able to drive a really large piece of hardware. This is another auger, and it's a different uh, uh, kind you can see this has a loop at the top and the cutting edge down here. This would probably have been uh, used to accept a metal bar. I have a stick here just to show you how it might have been used. So you put the metal bar in here and begin to turn it to cut the hole into the wood to drive a very large piece of hardware into it. Now, there was a special building project where the Spaniards say the Appalachian used more wooden pegs than they used nails. And they would have used a tool like this, an auger, to drill two holes into two different timbers and then insert a peg in it to frame those two uh, timbers together. Now, I think that really speaks to the skill of the Appalachian as builders, too. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, architecture and archaeology, as, at least as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you.